Hi, I'm Tony Northup and you have a new Canon camera. This is our tutorial for the T7i, also known as the 800D in some countries. First, I wanna suggest that you hit the subscribe button and hit that notification bell because we have new free videos coming out all the time that'll help you learn photography. You might also go to our channel and dig back through some old videos. If you want a tutorial for a different camera, if you wanna suggest a tutorial like this to your friends, tell them to go to sdp.io slash tutorials. We have tutorials for just about every modern camera. First off, I'm gonna be going through the basics of the camera, then I'm gonna be getting into some more advanced things, and I'm gonna suggest some lenses and flashes and tripods and stuff that you can buy. Uh, so you can skip around. Check the description of this video and you'll see a table of contents. You don't have to watch the whole thing and you don't have to take it all at once. And as you work through, pick up your camera and do what I do because 80% of learning how to use your camera isn't memorizing it, it's muscle memory, like your fingers need to learn how to do this stuff. First, I'm gonna go over the physical attributes of the camera. You probably already got it assembled. You can probably skip over this, but I just wanna show you the lens attaches. Uh, you align the white dot on the lens to the white dot on the lens mount, line them up like that, and they click in place. If you're using a full frame lens, it'll have a red dot instead of a white dot, and you'll line up the red dot here. Once you click it in place, I always just give it a little wiggle. Make sure that it's on there nice and solid so that it doesn't accidentally shake loose. The battery, pretty obvious. When you put the battery in, you'll look for the contacts on it, face those towards the middle of the camera, and then just slide it in until that clicks. And then when you go to take it out again, you'll just push that little gray lever there and it will pop right out. Make sure you close that. And the last door that we have over here is the memory card. Your memory card is your digital film and you absolutely need a memory card in the camera or it won't work. Use the label towards you, slide it in there, and then close the door behind it. Anytime you see that red light blinking, don't open it up. That means it's still writing to the card. You should wait until that red light turns off before you try to open it up. If you wanna buy a memory card, you can either go cheap or you can go fast. The cheap cards are great and will suit most people most of the time just fine. There's no evidence to show that cheap cards are less reliable than expensive cards. Where they differ in price is actually the speed. And if you are the type who's shooting in continuous and you're shooting sports, if you're shooting dozens of pictures at a time and buffering becomes a problem where the camera s slows down as it's writing, then you'll wanna get a fast card. Otherwise, you can probably get an inexpensive card and you'll be okay. Here's my inexpensive card of choice. Uh, you can pick it up at this sdp.io link. All these sdp.io links are Amazon affiliate links. So we get a few pennies out of every dollar that you spend there. And I wanna suggest that you not just buy one cheap SD card, but buy a couple. Put one SD card in your car, put one in your office desk. Uh, even if you're just buying $5 cards, scatter them around your life. Drop one in your purse or your wallet or whatever. Because at some point in your life, you're going to forget an SD card. You're gonna leave the house and you're not gonna be able to take a picture. So having these SD cards scattered around means you'll be able to grab one wherever you are. If you want to stop and read this whole thing, this is a story that I got from someone who took that advice, who bought cheap SD cards and scattered them around, and it saved a particular photo shoot. So I love having extra SD cards around. Uh, if you're the type who's shooting sports or wildlife and you're going to be taking a lot of action shots, or you just have an unlimited budget, I suggest you get a fast card. And the fastest you can get for the T7i is the SanDisk Extreme Pro. Get whatever size here you have the budget for. 64 gigs is not too big. 128 gigs, not too big. Means you might not fill it up for a couple of years, but that's okay too. It's nice to have that extra room and never have to worry about it, but 32 gigs is okay too. You do not need to buy a UHS-2 card. This camera only supports UHS-1, so UHS-2 is okay, but you won't benefit from the extra performance. This is the fastest card you can buy. If you're gonna be using your um, smartphone or tablet to do the editing, you can get an SD card reader that will allow you to connect directly to these devices. You can also use the Wi-Fi app, which I'll show you later, but I actually find these to be way faster and easier. So whether you get it for Android or for Apple, you can use a different link down here. Now, this SD card will go right into the SD card slot on your computer if you're doing your editing on a computer. Most computers have an SD card slot. If not, you can buy an SD card reader for your PC. Let's go over the physical ports on the camera. There aren't too many of them, but if you look over on the left side of the camera here, you'll see one port that flips open. This reveals a USB port on the side. Sorry, you can't use that to charge the camera, but you can connect the USB cable that came with your camera to your PC and unload your pictures. That way it should detect it automatically. 
There's also a mini HDMI port here, which you'll probably never use. But if you wanted to hook the camera up to a TV to play back pictures on like a slideshow, you probably wouldn't do that, but you could. There's also another port here for a microphone and a remote control. So if you were to get a remote shutter trigger, you probably won't need one, you could connect it there. And if you were to hook up an external mic when you're recording video, you'd hook it up there. An external mic could definitely improve your sound quality, especially a lav mic like the one I'm wearing here. Let's take a picture with the viewfinder because the process of using the viewfinder in live view is a little bit different. So first you'll turn your camera on by flipping the switch to on here. And then just to make things easy, you can put the mode here in green or the P mode, the program mode. Green will automatically turn the flash on and program mode won't automatically turn the flash on. You'd have to push the button over here to turn the flash on when you're in program mode. I don't like the flash to pop up automatically, so I usually use P mode. Put the camera up to your eye and the camera will autofocus. And then when you push the shutter halfway, push the shutter button halfway and you'll see it focus. You'll hear that beep. And then when it grabs onto something, push the shutter the whole way down and it will take a picture for you. Pretty easy, right? You can also check your level while you're using the viewfinder. Flip that screen open, flip it to the side, and then turn it 180 degrees and flip it back. And now you have a display on the back. Once you hit the info button here and you'll see the camera gives you a nice level. If you wanna get your information about your shooting settings again, hit info again. So you can see I'm pushing info here to kind of switch between these two things. This level is really handy because me personally, I've never taken a level picture before. So having that level on there will make sure that I get the horizon nice and straight and I don't have to try to level it on my computer later. When you're using the viewfinder, you can adjust the prescription built into the viewfinder to match your own glasses. So if you're a glasses wearer, uh, you can take off your glasses and use this by just dialing in the diopter. You, most people don't have perfect vision, even if you're not a glasses or contacts wearer, so it doesn't hurt to use a diopter. And if you ever look into the viewfinder and it seems like your camera won't focus or everything's just blurry, chances are good this diopter got accidentally hit. So everybody should do this real quickly. Just we're gonna move this little dial after we put it up to our eye. So I'm gonna put the camera up to my eye, push the shutter halfway so that I see the numbers on the bottom. And then I'm just gonna move that diopter until everything is nice and sharp. And I'm not looking through the lens, I'm looking at the numbers at the bottom of the screen. So get those as sharp as you can. Now let's talk about taking a picture using Live View. This is just like when you're holding your cell phone up. It's showing you exactly what's coming through the lens. To do that, you're gonna hit this little camera button here to the right of the viewfinder. So I'll hit that, it makes a noise, and now it's showing me a live feed on the back of the screen. You can flip the screen out, which is convenient because now you can hold the camera over your head or you could hold it down low and not have to get on the ground. And to take a picture with the viewfinder, you can do it just like you did before. Depress the shutter halfway to have it focus and push the whole way to take a picture. Pretty easy. Another way to do it is to use the touch screen here. I can touch and it will focus, but by default it doesn't take a picture until you actually push the shutter. If you want it to take a picture when you push the screen, look in the lower left corner of the screen here. You see how it says touch off? I'll push that and now it says touch shutter enable. And now I can focus and snap a picture with one touch. So just touch where you want it to focus. It'll focus for you and take a picture. I really like that touch shutter. You can see different information on the screen while you're in live view mode. Just hit the info button here and you'll see it'll oscillate through a couple of different options. This one, just kind of clears the screen to make it easier for you to focus on your composition. Press it again, and it will show me a little bit of information, like my exposure compensation down here. We'll talk about that in a bit. And push it again, and I can see even more information, like the format of image that I'm using, whether it's large or a JPEG or raw. And if I push it again, I can get my histogram here. Histogram really useful for telling your exposure. And if you aren't familiar with that, I have a book, Stunning Digital Photography, check chapter four in Stunning Digital Photography. I cover that in great detail. Once you've taken a few pictures, you'll no doubt want to review them, make sure that they look great. By default, after you take a picture, it will show it on the back screen for two seconds. So that might be enough time for you to make sure you didn't ruin the exposure, it's not out of focus, but you can review pictures at any point by pushing this blue play button here. It'll, take, it'll pull up the last picture that you took and then you can scroll through it using the little directional pad here. If you want to zoom in, you can just use your fingers here, 
pull right in just like you would on your cell phone. This works really, really well. You can also view different information about the picture by again hitting this info button here. So now I can review my histogram here. See how this is blinking a little bit? That means some parts of the picture were overexposed. And if those were important parts of the picture, I'd want to go back, dial in uh, a stop of exposure compensation, negative one stops of exposure compensation, and retake the picture so that those parts aren't lost. And if I keep pressing the info button, it'll go back to the original view here. What if you find a picture that you really like and you want to make sure you can find it on your computer later? Pull it up in the reviewing screen and then hit the Q button. Hit this star here. And then you can set it to four or five stars. Now when you pull the images into something like Adobe Lightroom, it will show up as having four or five stars. And then you can filter your pictures and immediately find that picture that you've liked. Kind of doing this culling process on your camera can save you a lot of time at your computer because you can just mark the pictures as you're taking them, right? So let's go over some basic modes of the camera. We've been using just the P mode or the green mode here, and that's great. No worries at all. But the whole point of getting a camera like this is that you can take manual control. You can creatively express yourself by using the aperture and shutter speed and ISO to control how your images really look. And just to give you some idea of the differences, look at these three pictures of the same scene and all I've done between these three pictures is change the aperture, the f-stop. So at f1.8, you can see the background here is completely blurred. And what this does is it makes our subject in the foreground really stand out. It makes it pop, but it hides a little bit of the context. You might get the idea that she's on a city street, but you can't see the details of the building behind her. If you want to paint a different picture, if you want to show the context with the foreground subject, if you want the background to be nice and sharp, you would use a high f-stop number. So as the photographer, these are creative choices that you're making all the time. There are different settings on your camera, camera, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, but aperture is probably the most important one. If you decide that you don't want the camera to be picking the aperture for you, you want to take control and do it yourself, you're going to put the camera in aperture priority mode. And on Canon cameras, that's marked with an AV. So I'll just move the mode dial until it says AV here. It's really helpful. It's going to tell me exactly what my aperture is here. You can see a diagram of the aperture in the current setting, which is f5.6. Even, it even shows you a little illustration. Like to the left here with lower f-stop numbers, I have a more blurred background. And to the right with higher f-stop numbers, I have a sharper background. I can adjust this using the main dial here. It's right next to the shutter. Very convenient location, right? So move that down or move it up. Down and you can see it in real time on the back of the screen. It's telling you exactly what your f-stop number is. Most of the time, you want to use the lowest f-stop number possible. That's usually the right choice. If you take a picture at the lowest f-stop number and the background is not sharp enough, then just crank it over to the right. Get that background a little bit sharper. Find Maybe find the sweet spot somewhere in between. It doesn't have to be all the way to the left or to the right. But again, once you're beginning, um, it's, you're probably better off just using f-stop numbers towards the low end of the, the spectrum. If you're, you're at the low end of the spectrum and you're not seeing crazy background blur, like I showed you here, it's probably because of the lens that you're using, the kit lens. At the end of this video, I'll suggest a couple of lenses that you can swap out that will give you way more background blur. If you want to know everything about f-stop, visit this link, sdp.io slash f-stop. That'll take you to a free video where I just get really deep into how Aperture really, really works. Uh, another way to learn about f-stops is to just experiment on your own. So here's a little practice you can do. I'm going to turn on live view here by pushing that little camera button. With a focus on the keyboard, you can see the back screen there is really blurry, right? Where it says DOF preview. That's because my f-stop number is low, but even if I set the f-stop number high, like here it's all the way at f22, it's still blurry. That's because the camera does not preview the effect of your aperture when you're using the viewfinder or the rear screen, not by default. But it gives you a button that will preview it for you, and it's the depth of field preview button. So I'll push it now so we can see what's happening. And as I push that, look at the, look at the screen here in the background. As I push it, bam, it comes right into focus, right? Without it, with it. And that's because I'm at f22, and it's only showing me the effects when I push that depth of field preview button. So if you want to see the effect in real time before you take the picture, push the depth of field preview button here. It's just below the lens release button, little tiny button that you might not otherwise notice. Push it like that, 
it'll click on. Now, what about when you're not using Live View, you're using the viewfinder, and you're looking through the viewfinder and everything's fine, and then you push the depth of field preview button, and the screen goes black. What's going on? Well, that's because suddenly it's using a very small opening like this, a small f-stop, and it's letting in very little light. So, of course, it gets very dark. You don't see that in live view because the camera is smart enough to compensate and just kind of brighten the whole image up. Depth of field preview is really only useful when you're uh, using the live view screen. What if this just blew your mind? I, I have so many people who set their camera to aperture or shutter priority or one of these other settings and then pretty soon all their pictures are messed up. If you're ever confused, just go green. Just switch your mode dial back to green here and go back to taking pictures. In green, your camera makes all the decisions for you and it allows you to focus on the composition, the art, the mood, the storytelling, the stuff that is way more important than your camera settings in photography. So don't hesitate. Don't feel like you're a noob just because you're in green mode. It just means that you get the opportunity to focus on the more artistic aspects of photography. Let's talk about shutter priority. If you want to control the speed of the shutter, you can show or hide any movement that's in a scene. Here's an example. This is me and my daughter. We're both on this little spinny thing. Well, it's my daughter when she was like five. She's way older now. But on the left here, you can see at one eighth of a second, a fairly slow shutter speed. There's a ton of movement in the background, lots of blur. Speed it up some, all the way to 1 125th, and we're still spinning, but the background here is completely frozen. Depending on what I choose for the shutter speed, I will show more or less motion in a picture. If somebody's running, if a car is driving, you'll see that motion. And that is, as a photographer, one of the creative aspects of picture taking, and it does make a big difference. If you want to control the shutter speed, Take your mode dial here and set it to TV, time value, TV. And if we flip open the back screen here, once again, Canon gives us a nice little description of what's happening in TV mode. You can see with slower shutter speeds, you'll see flowing motion. And with faster shutter speeds, everything will be frozen. So I can go over here to freeze motion or over here to show lots of movement. You know, an average shutter speed is probably 1 60th. 1 60th is good for most situations. But there's no one right answer because it's again, it's your decision as a photographer to choose what you want the picture to convey. B but I would caution you against just picking the fastest possible shutter speed because you want to freeze motion. If, if you're just taking pictures of your kid's soccer game or some other sport, one two fiftieth of a second is usually plenty fast. And if you go too fast, well, your images are going to get noisy because you're letting in less light and the camera doesn't needs as much light as possible to produce clean images. If it's something like, uh, college sports, high school sports, professional sports, you might be more at like 1 500th or 1 1,000th of a second. Things like flying birds, you might be at 1 2,000th of a second. If it's a hummingbird, you might get up to 1 4,000th of a second. You don't generally need to always just crank it all the way to the right. For detailed information about shutter speed and which you should use, watch this video at sdp.io slash shutter. It's completely free. What if you want to control both the aperture and the shutter speed. It's kind of advanced. You don't need to jump right into it, but when you do get there, all you have to do is put the camera into manual mode. So I'm gonna take the mode dial and set it over to M. You can see now it's showing me my shutter speed at the top and then my f-stop number. The main dial here, as I adjust it, adjusts the shutter speed to whatever I want. And if I want to adjust the aperture, I'm gonna hold down this AV button. See it right there, it says AV. It's got a little plus or minus. I'm gonna hold that down and then I'm gonna move the main dial and pick whatever aperture I want. Now, even though I'm in manual mode, the camera is still using auto exposure because it's making, at this point, it's making one of the decisions for me, which is the ISO. The ISO just controls the brightness of the image relative to how much light it's actually gathering. So whatever you set those to, the camera's gonna adjust the ISO to make up for it. So you should get a well-exposed picture no matter what you do. You can take control of the ISO too. I'll show you that in just one second. If you want to know how to use manual mode, picking the correct aperture, shutter, and ISO for a scene, visit sdp.io slash go manual. It's another free video. If you're working through stunning digital photography and you get to the night photography chapter, you'll know that there are times when you want to use bulb mode to go do really long exposures. Like maybe you want to show the movement of the stars in the night sky. I want to show you how to do bulb mode. You'll use bulb mode by going into manual mode. You're just going to use the main dial here to set the shutter speed all the way to the left, you can see we went from 
half a second here, down to one second, and as I keep going left, keep going left, we'll get to 30 seconds. 30 seconds is the longest shutter speed in the camera, but we can go one more to bulb mode. And now in bulb mode, the shutter is going to stay open for as long as I have my finger on the shutter. And as soon as I release it, it's going to let go. So you could take a five minute exposure by holding your finger on the shutter for five minutes. So it'll count down how long it's been open. But if you did that, you'd probably be shaking the camera and it would, you'd probably get bored. <laughs> so if you did want to keep the shutter open for longer than 30 seconds, you would open this port on the side and connect a remote shutter trigger. Honestly, there's not too many scenarios nowadays where bulb mode is the right choice, but I did want to show you where it was. Hey, I'm going to show you how to use your camera, but that's like telling somebody how to drive a car, right? There's a lot more subtlety in driving a car and navigating traffic and communicating with other people and keeping yourself safe uh, than you could possibly do by explaining to somebody where the steering wheel and the clutch was. It's kind of the same deal, right? I'm going to show you the buttons and dials, but if you want to learn how to create beautiful pictures, artistic pictures, pictures that tell a story that capture emotion and moments, you need to learn the art of photography. You can do that with my book, Stunning Digital Photography, which has 12 hours of video built into it. So it's a video book. You can read the book like a book, or you can just watch the videos, or you can do neither. And you can just go through the practices that it has in there. You can join the Facebook group and get support from other people, share your pictures, find out how, how you're doing. You can take little quizzes along the way to just assess your own skill levels. It's the best way to learn photography. It's the number one photography book in the world. You can go to Amazon and search for Tony Northrup or Stunning Digital Photography and check out the reviews there. Or you can order it directly from me at sdp.io slash store with worldwide shipping. And if you're not happy, I'll just give you your money back. Once you get to the point where you're editing your pictures, loading them onto your computer, organizing your pictures, you want Adobe Lightroom. I have books for all the recent versions of Lightroom that also include video. And if you get heavy into it, I have a book on Photoshop and my photography buying guide here will help you pick the right cameras, lenses, and accessories, help you buy used. It can save you thousands of dollars if you're buying other camera gear. It'll, it'll help you out a lot. So check them all out at sdp.io slash store, or again, Tony Northrup at Amazon. Let's talk about the shutter modes. As I push the shutter down, it will focus, and then when I take a picture, it takes just one picture, right? What if you're shooting sports and you want to take pictures like click, 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 click? You would change the shutter mode. Right now it's in one shot mode. To change the shutter mode, I'm going to push the little button here. You see, it looks like a stack of copies. And when I do that, it brings this screen up. And now I can scroll through the different modes. My favorite mode here, the one I use all the time, is high speed continuous. So I'll push set to select that. And with high speed continuous set, I can do this. That's a lot better for shooting sports, right? But I use it all the time. Even if I'm just taking a portrait of somebody, I wouldn't just take one picture. I would take hmm, three or four. You know why? Because people blink. And if you just had one picture and you found out later that they blinked in that one picture, then you, you wouldn't have the picture, right? If you take four pictures, it's super easy to delete three of them, and chances are good that one of them is going to be a little bit better than the others. It never hurts to take a couple of pictures. The more important the subject, the more pictures you can take, because it's digital film. It doesn't cost you anything to take a couple of extra pictures, but it can save you a lot of trouble. Now, you can activate, you can change the shutter mode by pushing this button like I just showed you, or you can hit the Q button here. This will let you change just about any setting and all the most important settings. It's just quick settings. So when I push Q there, right here on the screen, you can see it's giving me the option for uh, single continuous. So I can push that and then just use the main dial to scroll between the different modes. It's just two ways to do exactly the same thing. Maybe one of those resonates with you. Maybe you're the type who likes to memorize buttons. Or you could just remember, hey, whatever I want to do, I do it with the Q button. There are a couple of other options here that are good to know about. If high speed continuous is too fast, if you find you're just taking too many pictures, you can go to low speed continuous. It's just a little slower. Maybe that's more your pace. <laughs> uh, you also have the option for a couple of different self timers. You have a 10 second self timer here. When you select this and you push the shutter button, you can see it blinks the yellow light in the front and it waits 10 seconds and then it takes a picture. You know what this is for. You put the camera on a tripod and then you run around and you get in the picture with your family and you take that group selfie, right? Uh, you can also 
do a two second self timer like that. You know what two seconds is for? It's not enough time to run with your family, but you can put your camera on a tripod and two second delay is enough to just improve the sharpness of the picture a little bit. Because if you don't have a delay and you're on a camera, then when you push the shutter, you shake the camera a little bit. But when you wait two seconds, all the shake gets out of the camera. Just when you're on a tripod, use the two second delay to get sharper pictures. You also have the option here for a self timer continuous. And that's pretty useful because you know what you can do? You can have it take like 10 pictures. And with that selected, you can take a picture. Here we go. That's good, right? Because in that selfie, somebody will blink. And if you have 10 pictures, then chances are good that you'll have one picture that's good. So if I am doing some sort of group selfie, I'll do the continuous timer with the delay. But for now, I'll just put it back to high speed continuous because that's what I use in my daily life. There's also different modes for focusing. You know, when you look through the viewfinder, you probably saw all the focusing points light up and then it beeped and stopped focusing. And that's great. That gives you the most precise focusing possible when you're shooting a still subject. But if you're shooting your kid's baseball game and they're running to first base, it's going to focus on them wherever they're standing at the moment and then stop focusing. So by the time you take a picture, they'll have moved to a different spot. This is called AFS. It's single autofocus and it's only good for still subjects. It's not good for moving subjects. If you want to focus on moving subjects, you'll switch to AFC instead. So you can hit the AF button here and go over to AI Servo. One shot is what I call AFS. One shot is focus, stop focusing. AI Servo focuses on moving subjects. So if you, you can put in AI Servo and then push the button halfway and focus on something close and then point your camera at something far away. And every time you do this, the camera will refocus works the same way if somebody's coming towards you. So use AI servo for action, one shot for still subjects. You can also change that by using the Q button here. See this last option here, AI servo. Switch that over to one shot. No problem at all. You can also choose different focusing points. By default, the camera will have all focusing points active. And that does not mean that the entire picture will be in focus. It means the camera will focus wherever it feels like. But you're the photographer, right? You should be telling the camera precisely where to focus. For example, if you're taking a portrait, you always want to focus on the person's closest eye. If it's a group portrait, you probably want to focus on somebody in the middle row. You could leave that up to the camera, but sometimes the camera focuses in the wrong spot. So for me, I always prefer to use a single autofocusing point. You can adjust this again by pushing the Q button here. Push the Q button. And then the middle one here says focusing position. So I'll push that and then I can use the main dial here to select manual selection one point AF. That's my favorite focusing mode. Now I can work with just the center autofocus point. Even if I want to focus on some other part of the frame, use a technique called focus and recompose. Use that center autofocus point, put it on the person's eye, hold the shutter button halfway, that'll focus it. And then just recompose the shot and take your picture. That works only in one shot mode. Focus and recompose does not work well in AI servo mode. You can also move the focusing point so it's focusing on a different part of the picture. To do that, let's wake the camera up. We're going to push this button here. You can see on the top it has like a little grid. That's representing your focusing points. So push that and now you can see you can select different focusing modes. You can go back to all focus points if you want to. You don't want to. Stick with that one focusing point and then we can use this to choose whatever focusing point you want. So if you're following the rule of thirds, you might put the focusing point right over there. And if you don't know what the rule of thirds is, check chapter three in stunning digital photography. So I'll select that and then I'll hit that little back arrow here. And now when I look through the viewfinder, I can see a different focusing point is selected. You can also do all of this while you have the camera up to your eye. Just hit that same button and then use the directional pad to select the different focusing point. Every time you hit the set though, it's going to jump to the middle focusing point. So just jump out of it by pushing the shutter button halfway. You can just go for it. Just take a picture. What if you want to manually focus? You're getting hardcore, right? You don't want the camera making any decisions at all. That's easy. There's a focus, autofocus switch on the lens itself. You can see AF and MF. Just switch it over to MF. That stands for manual focus. 
autofocus. If your autofocus is broken, if the camera refuses to autofocus, double check that because maybe the switch just got hit accidentally. Let's talk about ISO. ISO controls the brightness of your image and auto ISO is what I use most of the time. But sometimes night photography, you're working in the studio, it's good to manually set your ISO. You can do that by pushing the ISO button on top of the camera there. Just push that button, pops up on the rear screen here, and now we can use the main dial here to adjust the ISO to whatever we want. If you want to set it back to auto ISO, just scroll all the way to the left until it says auto. No problem. If you want to know more about ISO, check chapter four in stunning digital photography. Let's talk about exposure compensation. If you have ever taken a picture and it ended up too dark or too bright, that's because the camera's not perfect. The camera looks at the scene, makes its best judgment about how bright the scene should be, but sometimes it just gets it wrong. You're, you're human. You can make better choices than your camera, right? You can override the camera's decisions about auto exposure using exposure compensation. So let's fire up live view here so we can see it in real time. So let's look at the screen here. I'll focus on it. And as we look at the screen, this screen should be white, but it kind of shows up as gray. That's because the camera's underexposing the scene. It's making a mistake. To fix that, I'm going to hold down the exposure compensation button, which is the little plus minus there. It has an AV written on it. I'm going to hold that down and then I'm going to move the main dial up until the scene is brighter. Look how it's getting brighter in real time. And when I'm using live view, I can just adjust it until I get the exposure that I want and then I can take a picture. And now I have the nice bright picture that I wanted. When I'm done, I'll want to hold that button and then set it back down to zero so that my next pictures aren't screwed up, assuming that they're in different lighting. You're going to see a need for exposure compensation anytime you're shooting somebody who's backlit. Maybe it's an overcast day and you're taking pictures of your friend, but the sky is behind them and it's super bright. Their face would end up in really deep shadow unless you adjusted exposure compensation to add some exposure. If you were taking a picture of somebody in the snow, the snow is really bright. So the camera will say, oh my goodness, it's a really bright day. I'm going to crank the exposure down. You would want the snow to be nice and bright. So you would have to take the exposure compensation and add a stop or two. It's pretty easy. Another way to adjust the exposure compensation, if you forget what this little button is, remember, you can always go back to Q. So I can just hit Q here and scroll up. And this main thing here, see how it says darker and brighter? I can just adjust it down to darker or I can move it up to brighter. So again, if all these settings and buttons are too much for you, hit that Q button and just follow the prompts on the screen. It's going to work well for you. Bracketing helps you when you can't decide what the proper exposure is. Bracketing takes a sequence of shots, one that's properly exposed, one that's underexposed, and one that's overexposed. In the film days, when you didn't get to review your picture immediately, this was super useful because you could get back into the dark room and pick whichever one was closest. And you do that just for safety. But we still use it in the digital era for, um, well, times when we don't get a chance to review our pictures and we want to make sure we nail the exposure, but more likely when you're processing images using HDR techniques, high dynamic range techniques. And I'm not going to take the time to explain that now. I have a whole chapter in stunning digital photography if you're curious, but for now I do want to show you where you can turn bracketing on. So I'm going to turn that on and then I'm going to hit the menu button here. This takes you into our menu system. This is under shooting settings, so I'll select that and then I'll go to page two here and the very top option, exposure comp slash AEB. AEB stands for auto exposure bracketing. So I'll select that and now I can use the main dial here to, usually I'll just crank it all the way to the right. And so you can see it's indicating that it's gonna take three pictures, one underexposed, one properly exposed and one overexposed. So I'll click set and I'll just demonstrate what that does for us. Let's put live view on here and I'm going to take three shots. And now as I review those three shots, this is the first shot, what it thought was properly exposed, underexposed, and then overexposed. When you're done with your bracketing, go back into the menu system here, select that and then reset it back to zero. Otherwise you'll keep bracketing shots and you'll end up with a bunch of over or underexposed pictures. Once you do bracket shots, if you wanted to combine them to drastically improve your image quality, you could use Photo Merge in Adobe Lightroom. That's my favorite HDR software. 
Uh, if you don't have Adobe Lightroom, visit sdp.io slash Adobe deal, and you can get like a 30 day free trial to try it out. Let's talk about time lapses. Time lapses take a sequence of pictures over a period of time and then just create these like really cool fast motion movies where you can see clouds racing through the sky and traffic like moving at super high speed. You see it all the time in movies and stuff. It's a really cool way, especially if you're making videos for your family. First, you're gonna put the camera into video mode. The switch here, the on off switch, off, on, and then the video camera here. Once you're in video mode, you're gonna hit the menu button, go into the first menus here, and then go to page five. And if you scroll down, you'll see time-lapse movie. And disable means it's not shooting time lapses. So I'll select that, and then I'll switch it over to enable. And you can shoot, you can set the interval and number of shots however you see fit. This takes a little bit of tuning, but for the most part, if you're unfamiliar with making time lapses, it never hurts to set this number really high. So we can set it to 3000. And then if I don't have time to take 3000 pictures, I can always turn the camera off. And the interval, usually lower is better. If you're not sure, just set it to a one second interval and a whole lot of shots and put your camera on a tripod, start it up and go. <laughs> All the other settings here should be okay though. Beep as image is taken. You can turn that off because who wants the camera to be beeping 3000 times, right? Hit the menu button to get out of here. And now you'll want to put the camera on a tripod or fix it somewhere. Now to start the time lapse, I'm going to push the record button here. See how it's got the little red dot there? That means record. So I'll push that and you can see it's counting down here as it's taking pictures. Uh, I started having it set at 3300 pictures. So you can see the Interval here is counting down. Now it's at 3275. And this little indicator here is saying that it's a time lapse. If I want to turn the screen off, I'll just hit the info button. It's still working, <laughs> but turning the screen off will save you some batteries because batteries do really burn through when you have the time lapse going. Whenever you're done with the time lapse, just hit the record button and it will stop. And it automatically disables time lapse. So if you want to take a different, another time lapse, you'd have to go back into the menus and turn it back on. But now you can see I can go in here and play back my time lapse. And well, it wasn't a very interesting time lapse. <laughs> Let's talk about using the flash a little bit. You have a flash built into the camera. Super handy. If you want to turn the flash on, first you'll have to be in not in video mode, but in stills mode. So I'll switch this from the video camera over to on. And then I'll push that button and the flash will pop up. Now the next picture I take, Let's turn on live view here. Next picture I take, bam, the flash is going to fire. Easy, right? If you take a picture and there's too much flash, people are blinded and their faces are all blown out, you can use flash exposure compensation. It works just like the exposure compensation I was describing. To use flash exposure compensation, push that same button that you used to turn the flash on, push that again, and it will pull up this menu here. And now as you look at the last option here, you'll see exposure compensation. You can dial it down some. I almost always use the flash dialed down about negative one and one third, just because I find the default flash to be a little bit too bright. So if I take another picture, we just put out less flash. By the way, a stop is a double or a halving of light. So if I say one stop less exposure, that means half the light. One stop overexposure means twice the light. Let's talk about recording video. First, you'll put the camera into video mode. The on off switch here, off, on, and then the video camera old timey video camera, <laughs> switch it on there. And now we're in video mode. You don't use the shutter to start a video. Instead, you use the record button here. If you push the shutter, it doesn't do anything. You can touch to focus and then hit the record button and it will start recording. That's really all there is to it. It's a uh, pretty good. It'll be stabilized by default and everything should look pretty good. If you want to focus while recording, you can just touch the screen and it will do a pretty nice smooth focus pull from wherever you're focused to wherever it wants to be focused. There are some settings that you can think about for video. And just like with stills, you can control most of these with the Q button. So hit that Q button here. And one of the most useful is the digital zoom. Maybe you're shooting sports and your kids on the other side of the field, hit the Q button, go down to digital zoom, scroll to the right, and we can turn on, see it says approximately three to 10 times. So that's with it off, that's with it on. And your quality should still be really good. So that allows you to just get more reach out of your current lens. Another option you might wanna consider is the Movie Digital IS. IS is image stabilization. 
Your lens probably has optical image stabilization in, and that's good for stills and video. It'll just help take out the shake out of your hands. But if you want even more out of it, hit that Q button, go down to Movie Digital IS, scroll to the right. You can get a little IS. Look how much more stable it is. That's with it off. You can see how it kind of moves around. Turn it on, and it's much more stable. Or I can turn on Enhance, and it's even more stable. Look how smooth that is. Oh, it works so good. But you can see the more IS I use, the more it crops in because it's pulling from a smaller part of the sensor because it's going to be like mo moving around the part of the sensor that it's pulling the image from. So only turn it on if you're walking, if you're hand holding the video, if it's not on a tripod, or if you just want a little extra crop, that's okay too. Another setting you might want to consider in the video is changing the frames per second. By default, your camera shoots at either 25 or 30 frames per second, depending on whether you're in North America or somewhere else. It's an NTSC PAL thing, but you can double that. You can go up to 50 or 60 frames per second by hitting that Q button, selecting movie record size, this second one here, select that, and then you can go up to 1080 at 60 frames per second. And what that does is it records twice as many frames, and that will give you smoother motion or if you're the type who edits your video, it'll let you slow things down to half speed. So you can do some slow motion. You can do some really cool effects with that. What if you're thinking, uh, my camera's only letting me choose 25 or 50 frames per second and I wanna do 30 or 60? You're probably not in North America, right? You're probably somewhere that uses the PAL TV frequency. It'll be the default for, the, for other countries outside of North America. If you want to use NTSC and get those higher frame rates, hit the, Hit the menu button while you're in video mode. Hit the menu button, go over to the wrench icon here, and then we're gonna scroll over to Setup 3, and then scroll down to Video System. You can see mine says 4 NTSC, but I could also select 4 PAL. So you would just do that, and then select 4 NTSC. YouTube uses 30 or 60 frames per second as pretty much standard, so if you're in another part of the world, you probably wanna to switch to NTSC. Another video setting that you might wanna change is the audio levels. By default, the camera will come set to auto audio levels, and that can be okay. It's good for just run and gun, like running around shooting your friends or whatever. But if you hook a mic up to it and you wanna get good sound, you'll want to manually set the audio levels. To do that, you'll be in video mode, you'll hit the menu button, you go to the shooting settings here, page one, and then third option down, sound recording auto. I'll select that. You can see my levels here. If you wanna check your levels, this is the same place you'd go and then I'll set it to manual. And now I can go down to recording level, select that, and just kind of, oh, let's say if I drop it way down, then you can see my voice is getting quieter and quieter. If I crank it up, my voice is gonna get louder and louder and louder through it. And usually where I wanna see levels is never peaking, like the red is bad, so I wanna crank it down a little bit. Whenever I'm talking as loud as I'm gonna be, I want it to just be peaking into the yellow a little bit, and that's usually kind of ideal sound levels. Manual sound is gonna pretty much always produce better than auto sound in any kind of controlled situation. If you use auto with a mic, during the quiet moments, the camera will say, oh, it's really quiet, I need to crank the volume up. So during all the quiet moments between sentences, it'll like raise the ambient sound, it'll go, it'll go from quiet to like and then back down as people start talking. So you don't wanna use that. Let's talk about white balance. This applies equally well to either shooting stills or video. But I'm gonna say, your camera comes set up to shoot auto white balance, where it'll take a look at the scene and then just figure it out automatically for you. That's the same thing your brain does. White balance is this thing where it, your brain adjusts the color that it sees so that white stuff always looks white. If you're under a, a light that's a little bit yellow or a little bit blue, it'll make stuff look white. And it's kind of weird that the brain works this way, but it's the reason that if you have LED lights, which are a little bit blue, or incandescent lights, which are a little bit yellow, or halogen lights, which are a little bit green, they all kind of look the same because your brain is constantly adapting. Your camera adapts too, and it works just fine. And if it isn't perfect, then it's pretty easy to fix it on the computer later. But if you decide that you want to fix it in the, in the camera, it's really easy. Let's get this into stills mode again. I'm gonna hit the WB button here. Just hit that, and then I can just select whatever my current scenario is. So if I'm out in the sun, I could select daylight. If I'm in the shade, I would select shade. Or on a cloudy day, I could select that. You could see tungsten, fluorescent, uh, flash, or a custom. But again, for most people, auto white balance is gonna be fine.
let's talk about the different metering modes. I mentioned earlier, camera's making auto exposure decisions. It's looking at the scene and then saying, hey, this is how bright or dark it should be. It's, it's fine. The defaults are fine for most people. You'll never need to change it. But if you're like an old school film user and you want to know how to do spot metering or something, I'll show you how to do it. But the rest of you should just ignore it. <laughs> to adjust the metering, press the menu button, go into shooting options, and then go to page three. It's the top option here, metering mode. There's not a shortcut button or anything for it because it's something you probably don't ever need to change. I always use evaluated metering and then I adjust the exposure compensation up or down. But like I said, if you want to use spot metering, there's that option. Let's talk about how to format your memory card. Your SD card here, that is your digital film. And if you take enough pictures, you will eventually fill it up. And at that point, you can unload those pictures onto your computer. Make sure those pictures are backed up offsite, like to a cloud backup service and then you can format the memory card to reuse it. So to format your card, hit the menu button, go into the wrench icon here, and then right on page one, the fourth option down, format card. I'll select that, I'll say okay, and then we'll format the card, and now I have a fresh, clean card, ready to take a ton of pictures. Let's talk about using Wi-Fi to transfer pictures from your camera to your smartphone. Canon has an app that you can use. Pull up my phone here, Let's get into the App Store, and I'm going to go to the search option here, and I'm going to search for Canon, and it's called Canon Camera Connect. Um, you'll notice right away, it only has three stars, and I, I bet most of the apps you have on your phone have like four or five stars. Three stars is a pretty good rating for a camera Wi-Fi app but it's a pretty bad rating for other types of apps. Canon has one of the best Wi-Fi apps out there, but they're all kind of flaky and annoying. So if you find it frustrating, it's not just you. Uh, I'm going to open that up because I already have it installed on my phone. And you can see it's going to ask for some extra security. Now I can go through the process of connecting my phone to my camera via Wi-Fi. In a nutshell, I'm going to turn Wi-Fi on on the camera. It's going to set up a wireless access point, just like the one you connect to at your house. Then my, I'm going to connect my phone to my camera's wireless access point, and then they'll be able to communicate back and forth. Canon makes this pretty easy. From within the app here, I can select Easy Connection Guide, and you can see I've connected to a couple of camera, Canon cameras before. I'll select Connect to another camera, and it gives me a, a little bit of warning, but this will, for the most part, walk you through the whole process. Your T7i 800D is an EOS series camera, so I'll select that, and then I'll use the camera's built-in Wi-Fi function. That's what you should always use. Um, it'll ask you if your camera supports Bluetooth. That can make the connection a little bit easier. Now. I'm just following the prompts. They make it really easy here. Turn the camera on and press the menu button. Um, you don't actually have to do that. You can push the Wi-Fi button here. See, it looks like a little Wi-Fi symbol. I'll push that and it will take me to the exact same place, just a little bit faster. So let's skip a couple of steps. Now we, now the phone here is telling me select Wi-Fi settings, Wi-Fi, and then enable. So I'm just doing what the phone says. This is really easy. Now it's prompting me to register a nickname. This is just the name for my phone, for my camera. So it's naming it EOS T7i, which is fine. So now Wi-Fi is enabled, and I know the nickname for my camera is EOS T7i. Now within the app, you can see it detected my camera, and all I have to do is select EOS T7i. So I'll select that. It's connecting. In iOS, it's gonna authorize the pairing here. And then on the camera, you can see it says connect to this smartphone. This is just a security measure. So you're just saying, yeah, I trust that phone. Yeah, I trust that camera. Okay, so I'll click OK here. Now I want to actually connect via Wi-Fi because that's how you'll do actual transferring of images. You can do some things via Bluetooth, but Wi-Fi is faster. So I'm going to select Establish Wi-Fi Connection to the Camera Connected via Bluetooth. This just turns on Wi-Fi here on the camera. And you can see on iOS here, it's prompting me to connect to the Wi-Fi network. So I'll click Join. It's connecting to the network. And now it's going to connect to the camera. Bang, a Wi-Fi connection has been established. So now I can click Start. If you want to take pictures, you can use the remote live view shooting. So I'll push this here. And you can see it switches on live view mode. And oh, look, there you can see my cameraman, Justin. I can focus it by touching the screen. Go on, there you go. And it got it in focus, and now I can just take a picture. Pretty cool, right? You can even put the camera in another room and get some control over everything. There's, you have control over your exposure compensation to make the image brighter or darker. 
and you can change other camera settings too. I'll let you play with that on your own. Once you have some pictures, you can go to images on camera and browse the camera, pick a picture, review it, you can zoom in, make sure that everything is sharp, and then when you want to save it to your computer, just push this button at the bottom, see it looks like a little download icon, I'll click that, and it will save it to my smartphone. Now it's saved to my phone, so I can, you know, go into Instagram. Add a picture. There it is. Now it's ready for sharing. Pretty fast and easy, right? Let's go back to that app. Close it by clicking the upper right there. A couple other things. There's a camera settings option here, which allows you to uh, adjust some basic things like the time. That's an easier way to set the time than you might do from the camera itself. You can change your uh, time zone. Uh, or you can automatically sync it from your smartphone, which is good to do because your smartphone's time is probably more accurate. It's set automatically, so I'll turn that on. Before I go back, I have to click set to camera. It'll warn me if I don't, so I'll push that and then I can go back here and go back to the main screen. When you're done using your app, you can stop the connection so that you can connect to other Wi-Fi networks by clicking the X here and then disconnecting the camera. And that automatically turns Wi-Fi off on your camera so that it's not wasting too many batteries. Let's go over my favorite settings in the camera because I don't use the default settings for everything. The first thing I'm likely to change is that I shoot RAW instead of JPEG. RAW images capture everything from the sensor, capturing way more detail in the bright highlights and the dark shadows. And especially if you're going to be ever editing your photos, even in the future, this can allow you to produce much higher quality images. To shoot in RAW rather than JPEG, hit the menu button here. Go into shooting settings, click OK, and then on page one, the very first option, that's how important it is. I made it the first option, image quality. And what I'll usually select is RAW. If you're using an app like Lightroom or Darktable or even the Canon software that came with your camera, RAW should be fine. It'll be great for editing. If you're not sure what RAW is, but you might use it in the future, then you can shoot RAW plus large JPEG files here. So all these options are JPEG files, which are ready for sharing. The RAW files have to be processed before you can share them on Facebook or Instagram. So if you process all your pictures, RAW is fine. If you process some but not all of them, shoot RAW plus JPEG. If you're sending pictures over your smartphone app via Wi-Fi, make sure you shoot RAW plus JPEG because it'll do much better with those JPEG files. Besides RAW, another setting that I change is to release shutter without card. That's in the same page, the very first page of shooting settings. This one here, I turn that off. The default release shutter without card is on, and that means that if you forget your card at home, the camera will just let you take pictures, even though it's not recording them. And I can't tell you how many times people have gone out shooting without a card and not realize it because the camera just let them shoot. Another option I like to turn on is ISO expansion. That is a custom function. So I'm going to hit the menu button here, get to the top level settings, and then I'm going to go to function settings. Click OK. And then let's go to page four, custom functions, and this is custom function two. So I'll scroll over to two. You can see ISO expansion. I like to turn that on. And what this does is it allows you to shoot at higher ISOs, which are perfect for low light conditions. Those images are going to be noisier, but it's better to have that option than not to have it. You don't have to use it. I like to turn it on. I also go in and I change the max auto ISO. So to do that, I'll hit the menu button here get to this top level settings. I'll go into the shooting settings and then on page two here, I'm going to go down to ISO auto and you can see right now it says max ISO auto 6400. Sometimes you're in really dark environments and you might need a higher ISO. Go ahead and let the camera choose ISO 25600. Uh, another setting I like to change is to turn on the viewfinder display level. I'll hit the menu button under the wrench icon here, function settings, I'm going to go to page two. And the very last option here, viewfinder display, I'll select that. And then electronic level, I'm going to show that. Now, I showed you earlier how you can use the rear screen, hit the info button and use the rear screen to see a level. But you can't really see that when you have your eye up to the viewfinder. So the viewfinder level appears in the lower left corner when you have your shutter pushed, your finger halfway on the shutter. So as you move the camera level or off level, it just shows you whether you're level or off level. Just put the camera up to your eye and take a look. You'll see it down there once you turn that on. Another must have setting is to turn off that beep. 
I don't know why it beeps, because you can see when it's in focus and the beep just annoys the people around you. So hit the menu button, go into the function settings here, and then page three, you'll see beep from enable, go to disable. Now your camera's silent and you won't be bugging everybody. One last thing you might do is to set the copyright information to put your name in all the pictures. That's just useful and sometimes it can help people if, if you lose your camera and they find that they can figure out who you are. So hit the menu button here, I'll go to the function settings, I'll go over to page four, and then copyright information. You can see you can enter in the author's name and then you can enter copyright details. Here you might put in your email address or phone number just so people can, can uh, contact you in case you lose your phone or something. This first option here, display copyright info, will show you what was put in there. So, I don't know, I never heard of anybody getting their camera back from that, but worth a shot, right? Uh, another thing I like to turn off is a, to turn off the AF assist beam. There's this red light here, which if you're trying to focus in the dark, it will light it up to make focusing easier. But that light is really distracting and it draws a lot of, of attention to you as the photographer and I like to be a little more discreet, but also it doesn't usually need it. Usually it will focus in low light with no problem at all, so it's kind of unnecessary and distracting. So I like to turn that off. I'll hit the menu button here, go under function settings, page four, and then custom functions, the first option here. And it's custom function five, AF assist beam firing. I'll select that and then usually I'll just select disable and that's fine. If you do that and you find that it's having a hard time focusing, you could turn on option three here, infrared AF assist beam only, and that will put out an infrared beam that hopefully won't be as distracting to people. Another option I like is to use back button focus, and I won't describe it all here. If you wanna know what back button focus is, go to sdp.io slash YBB. It's a super useful option for people who switch between single and continuous autofocus. If you're always switching AI servo in one shot, you can do it with just the push of a button. I find it tremendously useful, but watch that video to figure out what I'm talking about. Hit the menu button here, go under function settings, page four, custom functions. Oops, there we are. And then go over to custom function 12 and select this and then select number one, AE lock AF. Once you do that, half depressing the shutter button no longer causes it to focus. When you wanna focus, you'll push this button. You know why that's useful? Because sometimes you don't wanna be refocusing between every shot. When you have that set, you can also go in and choose a continuous like AI servo like this. So now look, I can focus on the screen, focus over there, focus over here, and I'm not worried about it refocusing every time. It's so useful for sports, for wildlife, for night photography, macro photography. I just use it all the time. That's pretty much it. I've shown you how to use all the basics of your camera. That should be plenty to get you started. I also wanna go through and suggest some accessories, some lenses you might want, some flashes you might want, tripod. One of the most common requests is people wanna blur the background for portraiture. It's so useful. There's a cheap way to get, for, get into this for about 125 bucks. Check out the Canon 50 millimeter F18 STM at this link here, stp.io slash C50 STM. Lots of background blur. But if you want even more, Upgrade to a more expensive lens, the Canon 85mm f1.8. This is great for portraits. It's one of the most common lenses for professional portrait photographers to use. Pick it up at this link down here. What if you want an all-in-one travel lens? If, if you find that the lens that came with your camera doesn't zoom in far enough and you want to get more, but you don't want to be changing lenses all the time, the lens I suggest is the Canon 18-200. to It's expensive at 700 bucks, but it might be the only lens that you need and it's a lot easier than swapping lenses all the time for most people. Check it out at that link there. If you want sharper images or you're shooting low light images, I suggest this monster heavy lens here. It's also expensive at 800 bucks. Might be able to find it cheaper used, but it's an F 1.8 lens, which means it gathers like four times more light than your kit lens probably does, meaning you can work in really dim environments and still get great results. It's also super sharp. It's perfect for landscapes. Pick it up at sdp.io slash s35. And if you want a super wide angle lens, if you're trying to zoom back and you can't go back any further, maybe you're in the mountains and you wanna get some awesome landscapes or you're walking through narrow streets in Europe, that super wide is super useful. Everybody should have one. Um, I recommend the Canon 10 to 18 millimeters. It's a reasonable price for a reasonably good lens at that link there. If you're getting into sports, I like to have a telephoto zoom specifically a 70 to 200 f2.8. It's kind of the ultimate telephoto zoom. And this Tamron version is my current favorite at this price point. 
Look at that, it's a beautiful lens and well, you pay for it. At 1300 bucks, it's not cheap, but it will give you super sharp pictures and pull far away subjects in. That's what I always use for my kids' sports. If you get into wildlife, my starter lens here is the Canon 400 millimeter f5.6. Well, new they sell for about 1300 bucks, but if you pick it up used, you can get it for like seven or 800 bucks. This link here, stp.io slash c400 will give you the option to buy it either used or new. If you want a flash, good for indoor shooting, good for portraits, I do not recommend getting a Canon flash. They are very expensive, downright overpriced. Instead, I recommend getting a Godox flash. It's a Chinese manufacturer, but we have Godox strobes in our studios. They work fantastic. They're super reliable and durable, and it's 110 bucks. The Canon equivalent is like 400, 450 bucks. <laughs> so pick it up at this link there. Everybody should have at least one flash. They're useful in a lot of scenarios, especially as you start to get creative. If you want to be able to move that camera, that flash off camera for more complex portraiture, if you just want to fill a room without having that on-camera flash look, which can be so ugly, you can add a wireless transceiver and for just a few bucks more. So go to this link here and that will give you a flash and a transceiver for like a third the price of just a Canon flash alone. Now you can put the flash anywhere and get really creative with your lighting. I'm gonna suggest a very inexpensive tripod. Everybody should have a tripod. Everybody loves this Dolica tripod. It's only 50 bucks. You can pick it up at this link there. And in fact, if you search the reviews for this for Tony Northup, you'll see a bunch of people who bought it based on my recommendation and they love it. People seem to like it. One last plug for my stuff. The way we pay for this is by pushing people to buy our books and video training, Stunning Digital Photography. The ebook is only 10 bucks and it comes with 14 hours of video. It'll get you started. It comes with access to a private Facebook group where people will look at your pictures and give you feedback and help you out. It comes with a full book <laughs> that you can actually read. Every chapter has hands-on practices and quizzes that you can take to assess your own knowledge. It's the number one photography book in the world. People like it, check it out. Just go to Amazon and search for stunning digital photography and just read the reviews. I also suggest you check out my Lightroom book if you get into post-processing. It also comes with video, sample files, lots of presets to get you creative, books on Photoshop for the ultimate in post-processing, and my photography buying guide which contains all the details about things like uh, image stabilization and whether you need it and what the difference is between sharpness as well as tons of very specific recommendations for lenses, flashes, studio lighting, tripod, everything else. Any questions, add a comment down below and don't forget to subscribe. Tell your friends, thanks, bye.